we are continuing with the morning session, and now uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Joel Klassen from Facecraft, who will be telling us about uh, optimizing fermop fermionic mappings. Uh, thank you. Sorry, this, this, this changed for some reason. Uh, don't know why. This doesn't seem to work anymore. There we go. Okay. And then there's this thing in the middle. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, yes. Hi. I'm Joel. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a pro about a project that I did with an intern we had at Facecraft uh, named Riley. Um, and the sort of goal of the project was basically just that. Um, so we, we'd sort of been working on trying to build these Fermionic codes for various applications. And you know, we realized it was a bit of like a pain to just try to continue to build these things by hand. And uh, you know, it sort of seemed like there should be a way of just sort of automating this process. Um, and so what we wanted to do was sort of just figure out how to do that. Um, right, okay, so, um, uh, so yeah, this is sort of optimizing fermionic encodings for targeted to two Hamiltonians and two hardware, right? So you want to sort of pair your Hamiltonians with your hardware. Okay, so what are fermionic encodings? Um, they're sort of just like a really pithy answer, which is that they're sort of representations of fermionic operators on sort of qubit Hilbert spaces, right? Um, and you know, why do we want to sort of engineer these things, right? Um, we we want to engineer them uh, for maybe a number of reasons. The primary reason, from sort of the perspective where I was coming from, is that we want to simulate fermionic systems on on limited hardware, and so we want to sort of design these things to leverage like the, the hardware maximally. Um, right, you don't want to be sort of taking an existing encoding and trying to like fit it in some awkward way onto your, your existing problem. Um, other reasons that might be valid uh, are clever theory gadgets, right? If you're trying to maybe prove something about complexity theory, like the previous talk, uh, then, then you might want to construct some sort of bespoke uh, um, sort of transformation, which sort of buys you some, some interesting properties. And another reason I think which is worth considering is that it's possible that by better understanding the correspondence between fermions and spins, we actually might learn something interesting about the physics of these systems, like we might learn something about the nature of, of fermions in the real world. Um, okay, so uh, in order to talk about sort of the, the actual protocol that I'm going to describe is actually uh, really simple. Uh, but the sort of mathematical requirements for you to sort of have the protocol um, are a bit more complicated, and that's kind of the thing I want to talk about primarily. Um, you want something that's, that's robust, right? You can throw whatever you like at it, it, it and it will, it will work, right? And so I wanted to sort of you know, dot my I's and cross my T's when I was building this thing. Um, sorry, my timer is going to sleep on me, and I get anxious about it. Okay, it's gone. Um, so, okay, so we have these, so I'm going to give some sort of mathematical background, that's going to be a large portion of the talk. So we have these uh, Majoranas, right, they anti-commute with each other, they square to the identity, uh, and we have this thing called the Majorana monomial group, okay? The Majorana monomial group is just all possible products of Majoranas, right? Uh, and it's sort of decorated by phases because these things can anti-commute with each other. Um, and then what we're interested in is sort of this, this fermionic algebra, right, which is the group algebra of the Majorana and monomial group, right? So you take elements of the Majorana and monomial group and you decorate them with complex numbers and you take sums. And this is where your Hamiltonians live, this is where your observables live. Um, we may also be interested in sort of subgroup algebras. So we may be interested in some subgroup H of our Majorana and monomial group. We may be interested in, form, in taking sort of the group algebra of that, um, of that uh, subgroup. And so a common subgroup you might consider is, say, the parity-preserving even monomials, right? Uh, these are all the monomials which are products of even numbers of Majoranas, right? And these are the kinds of uh, operators that you build Hamiltonians out of, right? Because these are the ones that satisfy parity superselection. <clears throat> um, okay, so, so the goal here is to say, okay, well, given some group algebra on some subgroup of the Majorana monomials, can we find some mapping, right, that, that, take, that, that maps from this group algebra to operators on some qubit um, Hilbert space. And the map must preserve sort of sums, it must preserve products, adjoint properties, and the mapping should be invertible in the sense that when I perform an operation on my system, I should know what fermionic operator it corresponds to, right? <clears throat> 
Um, and so what this means is that we have to be constructing some kind of algebra star isomorphism. Um, and what you can show, and uh, you know, I, what you can show is that like if you if you take this mapping and you make sure that it it, um, it preserves sort of phases, uh, then you really just need to be thinking about faithful group representations of H. Okay, so you can you can sort of extend these group representations by linearity to the sort of algebra isomorphisms in a nice way. So this is so really what we're looking for are really group representations. Okay. Um, uh, and that we don't want just any algebra isomorphism, right? We're not just interested in sort of redoing sort of representations of C star algebras, right? That's sort of been worked out. What we want to do is we want to engineer our representations to suit our purposes, okay? Um, so what you want is a kind of machinery to sort of, uh, sort of uh, reduce the number of requirements that you have to satisfy uh, and then, you know, build some minimal set of sort of correspondences that sort of satisfy the, that sort of satisfy the requirements that you have and then to build these things out from there, right? So what we want to do is we want to have some kind of privileged set of elements, F, script F, right, uh, of, 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 your, of your algebra, and we want to map these privileged elements to some particular form, right? Um, and so, for example, the kinds of things that I've been thinking about is sort of mapping terms in a Hamiltonian to some low-weight polys, polys on some hardware geometry, okay? <clears throat> and so the strategy is that you partially specify the form of the mapping only on these privileged elements, right? Uh, and then you build up the rest of the mapping to the group generated by these elements, okay? Um, and a lot of this is gonna look familiar to people who've been f playing with this stuff, but I think it's worth sort of getting into the really precise details of how this works, because I think there's some interesting insights to be had here. Okay, so the assumption for this work is that we're gonna be mapping monomials to polys, right? So these are sort of these generator-preserving mappings, as it were, right? So you're, you're, you're going from some subgroup into the polys, and the polys you know, everyone sort of knows what the poly group is, okay? Uh, okay, so what are these sort of minimal constraints that you need to satisfy in order to construct these mappings, right? And this, this should kind of almost look familiar to many of you because of the previous talk, right? These mappings must preserve sort of group commutation relations, okay? So you have some, some privileged elements and you wanna make sure that these satisfy these group commutation relations. And they also have to satisfy sort of inverse slash adjoint relations. The inverse and adjoint relations are sort of the same because these things, because of the algebraic structure of these things. And, and these, this, this relation sort of comes for free from mapping into polys, right? But this relation is really the important relation, okay? These anti-commutation relations. Um, and, um, but it's important to note that this is not an exhaustive list of relations, right? This group has other, other properties, right? There's product relations between these Majoranas, and these product relations aren't manifest in these conditions, okay? But the claim here is that, you know, so, so at this stage, we don't, we don't have a group representation of H, but the claim here is that once we specify something that spe satisfies these conditions, um, then this uniquely specifies a group representation of H, uh, subject to some caveat, which I'll get into, uh, via descended representations. Okay. Um, so what are descended representations? Um, descended representations are these. If you have a group A, and you have a representation phi of A, uh, and then you have a normal subgroup of A, B, uh, and if B is in the kernel of phi, um, then there exists a representation phi prime of the quotient group, A quotient B, uh, which is just sort of the natural definition, right? You just take the, 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 the privileged element, this, this element A, like A times B, and then B goes to the identity under phi, and so this is all sort of consistently defined. So you just define phi prime as its action on A, on, of phi on A, right? And so in some sense, these are sort of the same representation just acting in different contexts, right? And so we can sort of drop this distinction between phi and phi prime, depending on what the context we're looking at, right? Okay. Um, why isn't this working anymore? Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so before I continue, I just need to sort of introduce this idea of a group presentation. Okay, so a group presentation, you have, you have your privileged elements and just think of them as symbols, not as Majorana operators. They're symbols and you're creating words out of these symbols. You have the free group of these symbols. And then you decorate that free group with some, with some uh, uh, relations, right? Inverse relations, anti-commutation relations, product relations. These can all be thought of as quotienting out some subgroups of the free group, right? These are quotienting up the ones that you know, equal to the identity kind of thing, right? If you have product relations equal to the identity, you quotient those out, right? And then what you do is you sort of relax condition three, right? We only want to do condition one and two. 
Uh, and so we had this new group, gamma. This is a group presentation. We have some free group on our elements, which are symbols. And then we just have these inverse and anti-commutation relations that have been quotiented out. And you can think of gamma as kind of the least common multiple of like the poly group and, and your fermionic, uh, privileged fermionic group that you care about, right? Um, it's the smallest group, group that can be, that has a representation to both of these things. Um, while still map, faithfully mapping the, element, the, the sort of symbols that you have in here into their corresponding Majorana monomials, okay? Um, uh, okay, so, um, so, so then, then I'm gonna draw a picture of how this machinery works now, okay? So we've got these three groups, we have gamma, we have P, so the gamma is this sort of like ascended free group, we have the poly group, and we have this privileged set of fermionic operators that we wanna map to. And then we get sigma, which is a representation of gamma, okay? So this is, it's satisfying condition one and two, okay? It's satisfying just the anti-commutation relations. Um, and then um, we have a natural map tau from gamma to this free group, this group F, which is just quotienting out this third condition, this product relations, okay? Um, and now both of these maps um, have kernels, right? Um, and uh, you can take these kernels, sorry, is ever, can everyone hear me okay? I'm stepping away from the mic, okay. You can take these kernels and you can, you can map them through their, their, their partner, right? The, the, the sort of the cousin, right? So you can take the kernel of tau and map it through sigma, and you can take the kernel of sigma and map it through tau, okay? And so what's going on here is we're saying, okay, this is, and we're calling this the stabilizer group because it's a commuting subgroup of the polys, and we're calling this the super selection group, okay? This is, um, wh why, why do we call it the super selection group? Because it's going to sort of define super selection sectors in our fermionic system. For instance, parity super selection, right? When the parity operator is in here, we're only gonna be representing one sector of parity. And similarly, if we have other operators in here. Um, and then the, the idea is uh, that we can, sorry, this isn't working. We can um, project into the code space here, right? And this, is, this is, should be familiar to people who actually do Fermi encodings, but, uh, but I think it's important to go through these rigorously. You can project into the code space of the stabilizer group, right? Um, and then when you do that, what you get, what you can do is then you can compose this map sigma with this projection. You get a new map here, okay? And now this is a, this is a representation of gamma, but the reason this representation is important is that now um, the, the, the kernel of tau um, is in the kernel of sigma v here, right? Because I've projected out these stabilizers. So this kernel is in the kernel of this. So now I can do a descended representation, okay? Um, by, by, by coming down through here. Uh, and then I can, I can quotient, but the problem with this um, descended representation is it's not an isomorphism, okay? Uh, and, and so it turns out that and the reason it's not an isomorphism is because G is in the kernel of sigma V, right? You can see that G is in the kernel of sigma V because I can, I can take this kernel of sigma and move it through here, it becomes the identity, and it becomes the identity again here. So, you know, it's also in the kernel of this map, this map, this descended representation. Uh, and what that means is that I, I have some ambiguity about what operator I'm applying, right? Um, and, so, and so I can, and in fact, this is the kernel of sigma V, and so I can do one more, one more quotient. Right? And now I have this group here, which is this group of privileged elements quotienting out my, my, my super selection group, okay? Um, and then this is an isomorphism, this descended representation, okay? Uh, now, if you're paying very, very close attention, uh, you will notice a caveat, but I'll get to it in a second. So I just wanna emphasize, um, so if we can find a representation of this sort of greatest common multiple group, essentially, um, onto P, then this uniquely specifies a faithful representation of this quotient group, of this quotient group here, okay? That's the machinery. People kind of intuitively understood this, but it's never been written down anywhere, and I just feel like, at least as far as I can tell, and I just feel like you need to sort of do this correctly, I think, in order to understand things. And the reason you have to do this correctly is because there's some caveats here. Uh, one is, uh, this only works if the stabilizer group doesn't contain minus one. If, if the stabilizer group contains minus one, this projector doesn't exist. Okay. Um, okay. 
So again, yeah, you might say this is, just seems like a complicated way of expressing what many have intuited about how to build codes, right? You find the things that anti-commute and commute, and then you project out uh, these stabilizers, and then you get a code. Um, but there are important structural insights that manifest here. First, uh, these two kernels can overlap. What does that mean? It means that it's a kind of a measure of efficiency, right? Because you can say, okay, this, this, um, this kernel here are, are product relations in this group that I want to have, right? And this kernel here are things that map to the identity in my polys, right? And so it's like I got these product relations for free when I didn't plan to, in some sense, right? Um, so this, this is a measure of efficiency when these things overlap. Um, uh, the, the super selection group G can, in principle, contain things other than parity. Uh, a lot of the Fermi encodings that we kind of know, um, you, you, you end up with a parity operator as being the, the, in the super selection group and nothing else. But there may be other symmetries in your Hamiltonian that you want to make manifest in your representation, because that will make things more efficient, right? You might, you might um, just want to not represent anything that breaks those symmetries. If that makes sense. And so you might want to include those in the super selection group, engineer things to do that. Um, and then, you know, it was kind of not obvious that the stabilizer group could contain minus one before we found some instances where, like, this happens. The compact encoding is the first place that I knew where that, that sort of happened. Um, and so there, was an, so there was an open question that I had in my mind, which was, okay, supposing my stabilizer group contains this minus one, can it be fixed in some minimal way? Um, and uh, the idea here is that you know, if you have some representation of gamma, sigma, right, which just satisfies these anti-commutation relations, uh, this is also representation when you, when you include signs in front, because it doesn't change the anti-commutation relations. And, and so what that means is, uh, what we've been able to prove is that, you know, via some like Gaussian elimination arguments, um, that um, this, if this minus one is in the stabilizer group, then you can always sort of fix it by just, you can always find a delta that sort of fixes this thing. Um, uh, okay, so why, why did I go through all that? Um, the reason I went through it is because the construction is robust, right? It captures a very broad family of encodings. Um, it's like all those encodings that sort of map polys to, uh, map Majorana's to polys. This is, this is wrong, sorry. Um, I should scrap that. But the, sort of the, the encodings that people use uh, typically have this form. You map Majorana's to polys, right? Three minutes, I'll try and go faster. <laughs> um, so searching over these mappings gives some good optimality guarantees, right? Um, many previous encodings, many, many previous approaches to sort of optimizing encodings would take a family of encodings and sort of perform modifications of them, to uh, sort of perform modifications of this sort of family of encodings. But this is sort of very broad. Okay, so then the rest of the machinery is quite straightforward, right? Both polys and Majorana monomials admit binary, rep, binary vector representations. Um, the group commutations are captured by symplectic quadratic forms, okay? Uh, so, you know, these vectors and these vectors, you apply them to different symplectic quadratic forms to find the group commutation relations. So then you just need to take the map sigma and tau to the polys and to the Majoranas, treat them as binary matrices. Okay, there's a little bit of caveat for, like, um, projective representations, but that's fine, we handle it. And, um, and then, then you just need to satisfy this sort of matrix equation, which just encodes the anti-commutation structure. And so then all we need to do is search for a binary matrix solution to this matrix equation. Tau is given, this is our privileged set of fermionic operators. And we need to find a solution that sort of optimizes some cost function, okay? Um, for our purposes, we were looking at hardware. The cost function we looked at was sort of like, okay, if we're mapping to polys, we want to look at sort of the minimal Steiner tree that, um, that sort of includes these vertices where the polys act in that Steiner tree, because that sort of acts as a stand-in for the cost of performing a unitary operation generated by that poly. And then the cost of the whatever code we find is the worst cost of any individual poly. It's a big, nasty search problem. We did the dumbest thing we could think of, which is just do brute force branch, branch and bound with tricks, OK? Um, and then you, so you sort of find the best poly, and then you go to the next column. And if you, don't, if you can't find anything better, then you backtrack, right? Uh, the biggest trick that we include is that we consider translationally invariant systems, OK? So, uh, we, have, we make big codes out of small unit cells. Small unit cells means small search space, but it ends up being a big useful code because it's translationally invariant. And there's some machinery that we need to think about in order to do translational invariance, but that's not so important here. Um, and then the second trick is that we just do some lookup tables to pre-compute commutation relations and costs. Um, and there are almost certainly better ways to do this. Okay. Um, 
but then what we end up with is we sort of look at a whole bunch of lattices, right? The top, cell, the top cell is sort of the fermionic lattices that we consider. The bottom cell are sort of the hardware graphs. And then um, we, we throw our algorithm at, these, at pairs of these things and see what we get, right? And so we, find 25, we found 25 encodings. Uh, 14 of them are new. 11 of them were already known. But because of this algorithm, we were able to sort of prove some kind of optimality for, the, for this cost function that we chose and for these geometry pairings. And because these are error detect these are these are sort of stabilizer codes, we can also check their sort of error detecting properties. And we found um, thirteen error detecting codes. Um, yeah, we didn't find a code which sort of I wanted to find a code which has like a nice example of this super selection group containing something more. We didn't find that. Um, currently, I'm sort of exploring sort of the structure of the sign degree of freedom and whether there's in interesting things we can leverage there. And more generally, I'm thinking about wanting to improve various simulation problems by looking at code families instead of a single code, because this sort of categorizes a family of codes, essentially, which is very broad. Um, and um, scratch the can we find examples of codes that do not fall into this framework. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's tricky, right? I mean, there's codes, and then there's sort of contrived sort of mappings. But anyways. Um, and yeah, can we improve the search algorithm? Um, and I should point out that this construction that I talked about, this sort of common, greatest common multiple and then performing these descended representations, it should work the other way around, right? You should be able to do it qubits to fermions instead of, I mean, uh, you, yeah, qubits to fermions instead of fermions to qubits, right? The machinery all remains the same. It's relatively symmetric. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm out of time. Yeah, so thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joel, for a very nice talk. Are there any questions? Uh, did any of the new new encodings uh, uh, diminish the, the the total Pauli weight of your of your Hamiltonian? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Like. So are your Pauli strings shorter, uh, longer? Do they have the same weight? Do you need uh, more uh, qubits, yeah, the, less qubits? Um, I guess the, the cost function sort of, yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, I don't, shorter than, than, than the other encodings, you mean? Yes. Yeah, um, yes, yeah. I mean, they're, they're the, 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 best, the best ones, <laughs> so they, sure. they necessarily are going to have some, I mean, I guess there's a difference between polyweight and, and spanning tree, is that sort of, I, I, I'm not sure actually then in that case uh, whether the polyweights, I, th I think so, yes. Okay, also, also uh, the search algorithm, the, can it, is it the biggest bottleneck that you have? Pardon? The, the, the search problem that you have to solve, is it the biggest bottleneck that you have? Yes, yeah, okay. the, it's, it's a big bottleneck um, and yeah, because you've got you know a lot of polys, a lot of terms to search over. It's, yeah. but yeah, that's that's the bottleneck. So, but can it kill maybe the any advantage that you would? Can can it kill any advantage that you you would uh, get in the end? The, the the amount of time they would spend doing the search problem. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think because you just do it once and then you have what you need and then you can go on to do whatever else you want to do, right? So, you know, these these like, you have. Whatever else you want to do is sort of independent of having to solve this problem, right? It's not like involved in any kind of iterative loop in, in what you're trying to solve necessarily. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I'll say that I appreciate that the sort of mathematical formalism I went through was a bit fast. If anyone wants to sort of go into detail with it, in it with me, I, I'm happy to sort of talk about it after the talk. So maybe I'll ask you one. Yeah. Uh, so. In those uh, fermionic mappings, you have some cost function that you minimize. Mm -hmm. Would your analysis uh, carry over to you know, uh, considering a mapping where you want to implement, where you want to realize a fault-tolerant computation? Um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a complicated question. I'm not sure, I, like, if you want to realize a fault-tolerant computation, because I mean, here you can, you're talking you can, about if you can cook up like a pretty independent cost function for your fault tolerant computation, like number of T gates or something like this, for then instance. then 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 it, it could play a role there. Um, but 
Yeah, I think that's a, it's a little subtle, I think. Yeah. But I guess you would build on, on your mapping first, right? You would consider like two stage process where you first map using your mapping and then uh, you convert the circuit that you get into a full tolerance circuit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that question. Any other Any questions? questions? Yeah. <laughs> I only need one. Um, yeah, so there's a, a paper from a, a year or so back by uh, Zoltan Zimmerbras and some of his collaborators about like growing Jordan Vigneur trans growing like Jordan Vigneur transformations. There's like bonsai paper. Have you yeah. compared your work to theirs? I think it does something similar, but yours is probably better. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't direct make a direct comparison. Mm -hmm. I just sort of it, it, they fall into this sort of I think they fall into this category of sort of taking an existing encoding and sort of modifying it to to to, to build out um, okay yeah and, and so i sort of thought well okay this should this should be it <laughs> but yeah, yeah, i, I so haven't too. i haven't done a concrete uh, comparison no okay yeah, yeah. thanks any other questions well if there are no other questions let's thanks joe again thank you